you had this reason to talk to all the goth girls and to get them half naked in your flat. So there were so many um, goth photographers who were always, always, always male. There were so many, like every goth girl had done modelling at some point in the 90s. Basically, it's, it's nothing special. <laughs> it's nothing special. And I was never good at it. People talk to you a lot more weirdly on the street when, when you look like, <laughs> like a complete freak these days, which is like way less intense than it used to be in the 90s you know in the 90s as I say it was verbal abuse from a distance I'm a huge hypocrite saying this because I love these brands <laughs> these days but honestly fast fashion has killed DIY or die and Camden Market way 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 less than brands like So hello, you wonderful human of the internet, and welcome back to part two of the Q&A. I've got, <laughs> it's very cold right now, I've got two hoods on underneath a very big wig, and I definitely look like a kind of hunchbacked witch bending over her cauldron evilly, but that, it's kind of a vibe. We've got a few goth-related questions in this patch, so... It's, it's kind of a vibe, it works. Hello, I am the voiceover goblin interrupting this video to tell you that should you require part one of the Q&A, it is in the drop down box linked. And I'm also going to give you the time signatures for all the different questions in this Q&A in case you should wish to skip over any of my effusive waffling. Thank you. I will just jump straight in. The first question I wanted to answer came from, oh, am I going to mangle this? Kazipalo Kalashnikov? I think I got that. Do you dress up goth just because you dig the look or are there deeper roots for darkness and or death? Which I thought is <laughs> very appropriate today. Um, no, I thought that was a good question, actually. I think everyone kind of has their own reasons for dressing goth, but particularly in the beginning, because I think when you've been doing it for a number of years, it kind of becomes, this is what my wardrobe is made of. This is what I do out of habit. And you don't, it's not like this, a thoughtful thought every day you know oh, I feel like representing death to them maybe some people do I don't I don't personally maybe some people do I think it's more a conscious like this is why I'm doing it in the beginning and I think for me as a teenager just like a lot of teenagers particularly before goth was trendy I think now goth is really trendy and we've kind of got some questions about that later on but now that goth is really trendy, I think a lot of people dress goth who are not necessarily into the subculture or the music and who don't necessarily have any thought behind why they're dressing that way. It's just, well, this is what she in is selling this week. And oh, I saw someone looking hot in that the other day, so I'm going to wear it. And I don't see anything wrong with that personally. I know a lot of people do. I don't. I think if you're going to claim the word goth, yes, you should look into what it means and that it's a musical subculture and rather than a fashion style. But equally, it has become a fashion style too. You know, you can look at someone and go, that looks goth. So obviously there is a fashion element to goth, but I think it's more of a gothic style than, ooh, that's a goth when you see them. But anyway, we're off topic here. The, the topic was, ooh, ooh, ADHD brain. The topic was, why do you dress goth? So yeah, when I was a teenager, goth was not particularly trendy and there was a lot of backlash. Like you would be shouted at in the street constantly. You always had to have like witty comebacks in your mind whenever you were walking down the street to shout at people. Which means I think a lot of people, self-included, started dressing goth partly as a way of being angsty and saying, get away from me. Like I, I've wanted to make a video about this actually as kind of goth as a defence mechanism that some people, and I think it's people with the angrier styles, people who lean more towards kind of black metal or Marilyn Manson type aesthetics, it tends to be a bit of a getaway from me. Like, you look very spiky, you look very angry, you know, the mismatched contact lenses. Anything that's, you know, mismatched contact lenses, I think, are the, the prime example of goth as a defence mechanism, like goth to get people away from you because it's very hard to make eye contact with someone whose eyes are mismatching it's like it's quite unnerving so I think if you go for a deliberately like really kind of in your face look sometimes it's a defense mechanism thing sometimes consciously or unconsciously because I think when I was doing this at college and I definitely was doing this at college it was an unconscious thing but what I was trying to do was to put people off coming near me because one, I didn't really want people to be near me because it was nerve-wracking. But also it meant that if I made no friends, 
it didn't necessarily mean that I was unlikable. It meant that they couldn't handle my style. They were put off my, my, by my style. They were prejudiced. They didn't want to come near me. So I didn't have to like take it to heart. It was just like, oh, they don't like goths rather than they don't like me. You know, so I think people <laughs> dressing goth as a defense mechanism is definitely a thing. But as, as for sort of darkness and death, that's not really my vibe. Um, I think... I think it's kind of a bit of a, a bit of a mistake about about goths and stuff in general. I would say, I was going to say metalers because obviously metal has much more aggressive death. Well, I mean, there's a lot of death in well, some death in goth tunes, more undeath. I would say in goth tunes than death. I would say there's a lot more death, gore, and murder in black metal than in goth. But equally, you, you meet black metalers who are very cheerful happy people but to want to go out looking really swoopily dressed goth I have to be not in a super anxious mood because obviously you do get people looking at you it does seem to be a free pass for strangers to come up and talk to you and kind of go wow that looks really cool or like particularly with teenagers these days why are you doing this are you going somewhere what's this about which is like way less intense than it used to be in the 90s you know in the 90s as I say it was verbal abuse from a distance so when I see teenagers coming towards me and I'm dressed goth like I'm I'm basically ready to throw hands, but um, it's usually these days they're really polite. You know, they, they come at you and you're like, and they're, they're suddenly like, are you going to an event or something? You're like, oh, wow, you you don't hate this? And they're like, no, it's kind of cool. So, yeah, it's people talk to you a lot more weirdly on the street when, when you look like, <laughs> like a complete freak these days. It's, God, culture has changed so much since the 90s, it's odd. So I, I have to be in a certain mood to be, to be able to like, yeah, I can deal with interactions from strangers today. So yeah, I will I will wear my crazy clothes. So there's, there's a lot of different things. That was a very long answer to one question. So moving on to another goth-related question from Cass Valentine, which is, do you think goth clothing has been oversaturated with cheap tat? And I thought that one was a good one. Um... Because fast fashion is is really just rampaging out of control at this point. Um, but as far as like goth and all of this, I feel it's, it's more a case of like, has the goth scene been kind of trashed by any of this? I, I feel like it's, it's more what's pertinent. Um, and I do feel obviously, you know, the old kind of like DIY or die attitude is in, you know, make all your clothes or fuck off kind of thing. Like, you know, the only way to be a real goth is to make all your clothes and to be very personalised and to be very DIY. And I think that attitude is, you know, it it is still alive, but it's a lot, lot, lot rarer. But I don't think fast fashion killed that. I think it was dead or, you know, dying um, a long time before fast fashion came along. Certainly, like, in the 90s when I was getting into goth, I, you know, I was making so much stuff. Like, every day I was hand sewing like full length velvet dresses I was hand sewing my own corset I never finished it but I had half of a corset that I kept for about 20 years because I'd like one day I'm gonna finish this even though I've lost the pattern even though I've changed shape you know so I got rid of it in the end but you know I was hand sewing my own flipping corset with the boning and everything um you know you'd sew patches onto everything all of all of this stuff um god my my own hair stuff my own Rex lace hair I would make and make hair falls to sell on eBay and stuff. Um, yeah, you, you, and you had to do this stuff because there, there just wasn't the array of clothing out there. You know, internet shopping was really barely a thing at all back in the 90s. Actually, another element of goth culture that has really been killed by, I suppose you could say fast fashion, but also by online shopping generally is goth malls and goth stores and Camden Market. Um, you know, I've, I've seen on TikTok actually recently a few clips of Camden Market in the 90s and early 2000s and I'm like, oh, this is so sad because that's just exactly what I remember. And it used to be beautiful. And it used to be such a pilgrimage going down there to go shopping and get your things because it was the one place you could really get goth stuff and it was a haven and it brought goths together and it made a social scene. And now that you can just click, click, boom and that's it you've, you've got everything you need we don't have to go out we don't have to meet other goths these kind of lower level daytime younger goth scenes because obviously you know you have to be a certain age to get into clubs or theoretically you know a lot of us particularly back in the day before anyone gave a shit about id did sneak into clubs aged 14 etc but for the younger goth kids shopping you know that was kind of how people socialized and how goth socialized and also you know making stuff you maybe would like get together with friends to make stuff to swap skills about how you make stuff 
So I do think this being able to get goth clothes online so easily and so cheaply, it probably is killing quite a lot of elements of goth, but I equally don't know whether it is fast fashion. This, uh, this is a really controversial view. And I'm a huge hypocrite saying this because I love these brands <laughs> these days, but honestly, fast fashion has killed DIY or die and Camden Market way, way, way less than brands like Punk Rave and Killstar. And again, I love these clothes, particularly Punk Rave. Um, but because we can get clothes that are way more gorgeous than anything, like, the, you know, 99% of us could hand sew or even machine sew, we buy those things online instead of making them ourselves. I think the people who are into DIY or die still make amazing, amazing things these days. And even the ones who stick to the, you know, the basic band patches sewn on and safety pins and all of that stuff, um, that is such an amazing look. And I, I feel like it actually often looks cooler than anything you can buy if you do have these personalised jackets with the band patches sewn on. Ah, oh, Toxic Tears. I've got to mention Toxic Tears' is jacket with the bones and the teeth and everything like that looks amazing. I really, really, really hope that Toxic Tears does a, like, Maybe, oh God, is it is it hypocritical to ask for a how-to on something like that so you can rip off their ideas? <laughs> I don't know. I would I would obviously have to like shift things around a lot, but oh my God, you know, just just never never leave that jacket in a corner at a club because I know, you know, jackets jackets are sacred. You don't pinch other people's jackets, but that jacket, I think someone would pinch. So um, yeah, so it, you know the the things that you can make, particularly because you can you can get so many cool like bits of stuff online you can get so many cool band patches you can learn how to make your own band patches and stuff these days so people can make the old classic looks and make them look really spectacular and the people who do look really spectacular but equally for the people who are into the kind of vampire romantic aristocratic kind of look you you kind of have to buy that stuff unless you're genuinely like a really experienced seamstress or something um so i think all of these things were sadly killed a long time before fast fashion by punk rave and kill star <laughs> and i have such mixed feelings about that i really do but anyway moving <clears throat> what is my voice doing <laughs> moving on to the next question which is from rachel aspton and is do you get recognized in public and if so how do you feel when that happens um largely it's at goth clubs at this point i've come to expect that if i go to a goth club i will probably meet one of my people there um and that's quite nice really because i i always go to goth clubs on my own like i i always go there generally expecting to meet up with people oftentimes kind of having a range like oh who's going to be there you're going to be there but i always trek out on my own because i fucking hate being trapped and you know stuck to someone else and if they don't want to leave i can't leave i hate all that stuff i like being able to just GTFO when I want to so I always go there on my own and you know I have to find people or someone might have cancelled at the last minute or whatever so it's really nice actually if I if I make a new friend in the club because they recognize me and it's like well you kind of like me and I'm probably gonna like you and that's that's cool I've made a new friend this is cool so that's nice um I've been recognized other places too which is, is really interesting <laughs> um <laughs> because usually if I'm other places I look like a fucking potato and I I'd then I'm like, how how are you, are you how are you, how do you know who I am? Because I look like a potato, and like you know, my my makeup, even when my makeup is fairly natural, I feel like there's so much contouring and stuff. My face looks completely different. So it's like, how are you seeing through the mask? Do my bone structure recognizing it? Like I have some kind of element of facial blindness personally, and I don't, I just don't recognize people when I'm used to seeing them with full makeup and I see them without makeup. I don't freaking recognize them. So people who recognize me with no makeup on, I'm like, you're a genius. How are you doing this? So um, that's 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 always a little bit startling. I'm like taken aback, taken aback, taken aback, and then and, you know, and then I then I flail because I'm taken aback, and then you know, I. I when we when we kind of leave and I, I go somewhere else and then I'm like just you, you know you know that thing where you where you have like endless conversations in your head or like muttered under your breath because you're like this is what I wish I'd said this is what I wish I did this is what I would have said if I was cooler um all of that stuff but um no it's it's always nice to meet people although if people know of you and they know of your content not not everyone is going to like you. Whoever you are, not everyone is going to like you. Some people are going to fucking hate you, which means that you're not just like a stranger walking to a goth festival anymore and like 
you know, everyone's opinions of you are fresh. There's going to be people who you've never seen before in your life and they already hate your guts. <laughs> and, all right, okay, they're, they're probably... Okay, so, the, you know, here's the golf festival. Here's the people who recognise you. Here's the people who hate you of that. But all the same, it's like some people here, I don't even know them and they already hate me. So <laughs> it's stupid because I haven't been to a golf festival actually since right at the beginning of when I started doing YouTube and nobody recognised me that time. Um... But I am hoping to go to one next year. So that's going to be potentially like, does everyone hate me? I don't know. We'll see. It's a really paranoid thing. But anyway, moving on to the next one, which is from Heather Rios. Thoughts on Princess Diana, which is a very random one, but I like it. Um, I actually met Princess Diana when I was about, gosh, seven years old. I think I shook her hand shook her hand. Um, it was only, you know, it was only one of those big, what they call a walkabout. I called, I, I'm I'm watching the Harry and Meghan documentary at the moment. I didn't know it was called a walkabout, but that's what it is. Um, you know, when the royals come out and they meet people, basically our whole school got bussed to this walkabout thing. And we were, you know, some of us were there like, oh, we're going to meet the princess. I was more so excited that I might get on TV because they were filming this thing. I didn't get on TV. I couldn't get a space by the barrier at the time the TV cameras went by. So I didn't really, like to me, princess, like I... I've never really understood the cult of celebrity, even as a kid. Like one of my friends after we met Princess Diana and shook her hand and everything, she was in floods of tears when we were coming away from this. And I was like, why are you crying? What, what's wrong? And her mum had to keep explaining to me she's crying because she's so happy. And I'd never encountered the idea of crying because you were happy before when I was little. That was weird to me. But to me, I was like, she's just a lady. And the first thing I said, actually... <laughs> She didn't hear me. The first thing I said after shaking her hand was to my mom, and I was like, "Mom, why is her handshake so floppy? <laughs> because they don't they don't like shake your hand. They just kind of grasp it, grasp it, and let go. You know, when there's like a lot of people, they just kind of grasp it and let go. And I, my mom was like, "It's so her wrist doesn't get tired." <laughs> So that was like my main thoughts on meeting Princess Diana when I was like six or seven years old. Um, I wasn't, yeah, I've never really understood the cult of celebrity. And obviously this, you know, this was before she died and before, you know, just as when anyone dies young in tragic circumstances, they become this martyred figure. And suddenly it's like, you know, more so, I feel like if I, you know, if I said, oh, I, I shook Prince William's hand, I feel like that would be less of a poignant thing to say than, oh, I shook Princess Diana's hand. There's, you know, it's very, when someone's died in such horrible circumstances, it's it creates this cult of personality around them. Um, but obviously that cult of personality did exist with Princess Diana even before, you know, she'd come out with the tragic secrets in her book about or books that were written about her and things about the bulimia and the self-harm and the suicide attempts and everything. Everyone knew she was already this kind of tragic figure and, you know, seeing the all the, the behind the scenes things of the press harassing all the royal family and stuff that, that is on the Harry and Meghan documentary, um, that's that's really dark and intense and you think yeah particularly i mean you know for people who are for the royals who were born into that family and into that culture i mean that's fucked up there's a fucked up way to grow up and it's surprise well to be fair a lot of them probably do go off the rails don't they and you just don't see it because they've got acres of ground to go nuts in you know um but it is a surprise that more of them don't go like really publicly off the rails with the way they've grown up and the way that child stars usually go, you know. Um, but for particularly, you know, the husbands and the wives who have married into this circus, essentially, it's crazy. Um, but no, the, <laughs> the Harry and Meghan documentary is really interesting. I, I don't, I don't know. I, I feel like I have been really, really brainwashed actually by, even though I don't read, I don't read the tabloids. I don't read coverage of the royals. I'm generally not that interested. I think like, like the majority of, of, I was going to call myself young, but young uh, British citizens. I think most of us are not that interested in the royals these days. I think, I think older people, like, you know, my, my mum is furious about the Harry and Meghan documentary. Every time something comes on the radio, it's like, why are they talking about them? Why are they giving them so much coverage? I don't care. I don't care about those people. <laughs> it's really funny because, because I think so many of us were brainwashed by the UK papers about Meghan and about, oh, she's so pushy. She's so, she's so American and pushy and all of this, you know, um, but actually watching the documentary, I know I know this is about Princess Diana, but I feel like the whole Meghan thing is is way more like current and what's going on. 
And I, I do feel it's interesting. And I do feel actually, wow, we, we have all been brainwashed. Megan actually said, I mean, I know it's, you know, it's basically her documentary. Of course, it's going to make her look good. I am trying to like remain somewhat objective behind this realization. But, you know, she, she does seem like a really nice person. She, you know, she, she, and she seems like a really good match for him with all the kind of philanthropic work and stuff that she's done and that she's into, um, you know, and the fact that she she was willing to fly out to where was it Botswana or somewhere and, and live in a tent with him for for however long and they barely knew each other and she survived that and got through it and you know they yeah I think I think I think they, they I think they're good for each other um, because I think the papers were really pushing this like oh she's abusive oh she you know she's really pushy and abusive look what she's dragged him away from his family and because of you know in my past having lost a friend to a similar sort of relationship um i'm quite quick to see that <clears throat> in other people's relationships that oh my god you know when someone gets pulled away from their whole family by their partner you do think red flag but equally when someone's family are basically you know are a business are a circus are this whole thing maybe it's good for them to just get the fuck out and live like a semi semi normal life um and to, you know, Prince Harry's always kind of been the rebel of the show. I think I think the younger one always is. You know, you've got the, the what is it, the heir and the spare. So the the first one is like you're important. The second one is like you're you're the spare. So of course they rebel and they do things. And yeah, so I'm I'm, I'm really enjoying the Harry and Meghan thing. I really am. It's it's very interesting. And anyway, I will stop waffling about the royal family at this point because it's it's a little bit too British. So. Um, Moving on, um, Hyperactive Child asked, how did you get into modelling as a teen? Um, the weird thing was I kind of was, I guess I still was a teen actually when I did modelling. I was kind of in my latest teen years. But when I was about 14 or 15, my dad's girlfriend at the time was like, you, sh you should get into modelling, you should be a model. And I'm really bummed that we didn't try for that, even if it had have been really full of rejection and even if it had have just been like, no, you're too short and you're, <laughs> you know, you're too short, you're too fat, go away. Um, even if it had have been that and it had have been really bad for me, I feel like at least it would have been a closed chapter. Whereas instead, my mum was like, no, you're, you're not, you're not even going to try out for modelling because I think it will put you off your schoolwork. And it was like, dude, um school is is like wrecking my mental health it is no good for me and having something outside of that that I can find some confidence in would have been really good for me or you know like say it would have been full of rejection it would have crushed me who knows but I do think it would have been interesting to just see I really would have liked to have tried modeling at 14 15 and all of that I mean you know I, I already had an eating disorder and all of that like how much worse could it have been Pro probably a lot I don't know but I wish I had. I wish I had tried that. Um, but in the end, I kind of drifted towards it once I got into goth at about when I was about 19, 20, because, because all, goth, all goth girls modelled in the 90s. I swear to God, every single goth girl in the 90s modelled. There was, because cameras were kind of these new things, so that, you know, any guy who could afford some kind of camera it was one of the few kind of types of artistic expression. There's so much more artistic expression these days with the internet and all the things you can do. And taking pictures was one of the few things you could do back then. Also, it meant that you had this reason to talk to all the goth girls and to get them half naked in your flat. So there were so many um, goth photographers who were always, always, always male. There were so many, like every goth girl had done modelling at some point in the 90s. Basically, it's, it's nothing special. <laughs> it's nothing special. And I was never good at it. Mm -mm. I um I was just just too stiff and too rigid um back then I I didn't you know s some photographers I had were actually quite good and they would tell me exactly where to stand exactly what to do with my face and to, where to look and that was great but if I had any who would just kind of turn the camera on me and expect me to do something sorry no that's not happening I, I you know awkward as fuck didn't know how to do it um it's crazy because people don't think there's any skill in modeling there really is there really is and I don't have that at all um I just even even now that I'm more used to like camera phones and what I look like and stuff like that, I can't visualize what I look like to someone else's angle. So, you know, I feel like I can get okay-ish pictures of myself, but you know, and I've I've not I've not tried modeling in ages. But if anyone ever takes a picture of me anywhere, it looks terrible, generally speaking, apart from apart from my friend Docker, who is an amazing photographer. Um 
and goes to well I used to when there were a lot of goth events docker would always be at the goth events taking pictures of people dancing and you would think that would be a recipe for disaster right but no he would always manage to get people looking just incredible um some of the best pictures i have of myself are docker snapping pictures of dancing me dancing and other people dancing and apparently it's what well, you know according to docker it's not skill it's just deleting a lot of bad pictures and finding the good ones um but no i disagree it's skill <laughs> um so at some point at some point i will have to get back together with docker and try to do some kind of photo shoot and see see if i've like gained any any skills at all since uh since when i was kind of a little little teenage goth but anyway the next question came from edna marsh and they asked would you try shrooms again or even just microdosing um i have largely talked about when it comes to shrooms my just horrible 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 nightmarish trip the was a nightmare but basically cured my eating disorder in one day um so that's the basically what i've talked about with shrooms however i did do them a lot of other times but always with uh with ecstasy and that would keep it positive it took the body load away it made it you know because the body load without ecstasy i felt like i was being crushed i felt like my internal organs were being crushed by the weight of gravity for eight hours and it was unbearable and um i did actually have someone message me recently and say you know oh this this happened to me when i tried shrooms and i just tried them again recently and it was amazing and none of this happened and you should totally do it again um you know and i feel like whoever it was like they're, they're definitely in their shrooms and hallucinogens are the answer to all life's ails uh, phase you know everyone has this phase when you get into hallucinogens and they fix a problem for you you feel like everyone's got to try this man everyone's got to do this this is you yeah you're wandering around with your eyes closed you've got to try this um and I had that phase too. Like I really thought everyone should just trip about it. You know, if you've got a problem, go trip about it. And it's that is not true. There are so many people who should not trip. You know, if you have any kind of like psychotic disorder or you have a family history of psychotic disorders, for God's sake, don't trip. Um, and I think, you know, set and setting is everything. If you have a lot of trauma in your past, like it's probably going to go somewhere really, 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 really dark. And you may not, you know, oh, just there's so many people and times and phases of your life where you just shouldn't trip. I will say I did have an interesting sort of trip experience last summer, which I haven't really talked about Um but I may at some point because it was it was interesting. It was it was very interesting. I wasn't expecting as much as I got from it at all. <laughs> I was expecting that this is probably probably going to do almost nothing. And you know, the minute it starts, I'm like nearly about to puke everywhere. <laughs> okay, okay, this works. Um, this is this is going to be this is going to be intense. <laughs> so so yeah, I'm I'm not like completely close minded to the to the idea of tripping in certain ways again but when it comes to shrooms no um would i try microdosing though yes yes i would um so long as, as long as i was like 100 percent certain this is like a tiny 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 dose and it's definitely not going to make me trip and all the rest of it um i'm very intrigued by microdosing it's you know it's doing the research and it's finding like contacts and all of this stuff that i haven't looked into um and i feel i feel like if i was still as depressed as i was last year um i would be much more pushed towards doing all of that but since i don't actually feel depressed at the moment i'm not so like oh i must try microdosing it's just kind of like oh that might be interesting sometime in future kind of is my vibe to that but anyway moving on jamie hayes asked will we get a video about your reactions to nicotine etc yes definitely that is coming up in the nostalgia project um pretty soon <laughs> what what caused all my body's fuckery and basically basically it's it's the reason i do youtube was my health going to shit and therefore so many possibilities being stolen from me I did actually make a video i did make a video explaining all of it like two years ago i edited it it's fully edited and for some reason i just never got around to post art i know why i was afraid of getting sued because i did um I did mention the company who whose product kicked off everything that happened to me um 
and apparently they are a very litigious company. They have sued the fuck out of people before, so I never posted that video. And um, when I make the Nostalgia Project chapter, I'm going to be have, have to be very careful about how I phrase everything and that I don't name them, which, you know, is disgusting. They ruin my life. Um, but, and I wish I'd tried. I wish I had tried suing them at the time, but I had this really unpleasant therapist at the time and he was so, you know, he was so convinced that everything that was happening to me was in my head, even though it's like, dude, um, literally doctors are believing me doctors are prescribing stuff doctors who are trained in medicine you are not trained in medicine you do not know um but nonetheless i, I listened to him and i was like i'm, I'm gonna sue them for my life and he was like no one's gonna believe you it's all in your head i i, I believed him so I've, I've now left it f for nine years it's nine years it's been if i come out with it now i, I just don't i don't i don't think i'd have a chance in hell of suing them so um so i can't i can't name them because it's like how you know, they can sue me, but I don't see that I can really sue them. So that's very annoying. But yes, I will, I will tell the story other than that. Bake a cake for me, please. Asked, weirdest thing you've ever seen on psychedelics? A lot of things. Probably the, the weirdest thing, though. The, the thing that has always stuck with me a bit, a bit of a like, but what did I really see, though, was that I was I was at this this folk festival and it had been a surreal day. This was the very first time I ever did LSD and I haven't told this story because it, it involves other people and that, you know, there's various things. I was like, it's just, there'd be so much I'd have to miss out. So I, I haven't told this story in its entirety, but it was the very first time I did LSD at this folk festival. Um, and I'd gone away from the people I was with to go to the bathroom, these port -a It was all like outdoors in the fields. Just as I was about to get in the port -a and I was like, I wasn't convinced that I was tripping yet. You know, you know, LSD is like, you know, kind of smooth and kind of dips and bows. And when you've never tried it before, you expect like, wow, like aliens coming out of the walls. And you, you don't know that actually it's, it's distortion. It's distortion, sparkling fractals, mostly distortion. Um, so I saw this woman and she, in <laughs> in her hand, she was holding the hand of... That sounds that's a weird way to put it. She was holding hands with this child, or it was supposed to be a child. Um, this this small sentient being was walking along hand in hand with the woman. Small, this 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 being, but it had the face of a lion. It you know billowing like it wasn't. It wasn't. I don't think it was a mask. I don't think it was like a flat cardboard mask because it had hair billowing everywhere. <laughs> it literally, it was a lion's face. It was three D. Hair was you know billowing around it. It was a fucking lion. It was a lion on two legs holding hands with this woman. I glimpsed it for an instant and then they they were gone. They were past me. And I was like... And then I went in the portaloo and I was I was talking to myself constantly. It was the only way I could like get the... Because I'd, I'd been doing speed with it as well because it was it was feeling weird. And I was like, oh, I'll do some speed and I'll feel less weird because that I did speed with everything back then. And it was not a good idea because I was just... I was off it. I was babbling to myself, babbling to myself. So I was in the toilet going, that boy looked like a lion, that boy looked like a lion. What the fuck was that lion? Oh my God. And I was like totally like Hunter S. Thompson freaking out in the toilet. And um, probably people could hear me on like, <laughs> all sides in this water lose. And, um, but literally to this day, I don't know why did the, ch the kid look like a lion? I suspect it was probably a little boy or a little girl who had longish blonde hair to hear and it was just blowing in the wind and I saw them just as the hair went across their face and it looked like a lion's mane and somehow the, the whole face distorted into like this lion's face I don't know but to this day I, I can't be sure that's like did I see a child who had some kind of like facial disfiguration what did I see I don't know but yeah that that has always stuck with me. And Emily Creative 801 asked favorite animal, which has boringly got to be a dog. Well, not boring. There's nothing boring about dogs. Dogs are amazing. <gasps> I'm meant to be dog sitting tonight. Oh my god, I forgot. Yeah, <laughs> there's a there's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful little dog coming round tonight, and I am dog sitting her. So I'm very excited about that. Well, <laughs> it would be if I hadn't forgotten that it was tonight. Um, yeah. So dogs dogs always dogs they're amazing they they they're the best people on the planet they're so good um they're such good boys even if they're not boys they're good boys <laughs> and, um, yeah dogs are amazing um 
I think they're unbeatable. I think dogs are completely unbeatable. Everyone should be more like a dog. So uh, on on that happy note, I guess I will I will shut up. I I still look like a hunchback witch. So uh, anyway, I guess I'm going to shut up and go away. But yes, if you have more questions ever, feel free to throw them at me on Instagram is probably the best way. In in the Instagram comments, throw them at me and maybe I will make another one of these because it's been quite nice just having a waffle while looking like an evil witch. So uh, I hope you have a nice day or evening or night, whatever time of day it is when you're watching this. So uh, anyway, over and out. Bye bye.